Merry Christmas and Happy New Year. Happy New Year. Christmas actually ended, our season of Christmas actually ended last year, and um, I always uh, thought it'd be kind of fun if we shared what everybody got for Christmas. No, we're not going to do that. But I got a couple things. Um, this I got today. Um, it says, I've read the final chapter, and God wins. <laughs> and that's my sermon, thank you. <laughs> The other one says, um, Pastor Warning, anything you say or do could be used in a sermon. <laughs> be very, very careful. Be very, very careful. I know who you are, and I'm watching you. I'm watching you always. No. Um, you know, being a, uh, a priest kid, there were times I was sure I was being used in my dad's sermons, so I would not do that to anybody. Um, yeah. As you may or may not have noticed last week, I was not here. Kim and I took a Sunday off. It was one of our first Sundays. Um, and the Reverend Dr. Amy Lindemann Allen presided and she preached for me. So I want to thank her for that. And, and I want to point out that one of the things she said in her sermon was that we live in a world of darkness, yet a light shines in the darkness and the darkness cannot overcome the light. And we represent that today and in any church, with our Paschal candle, this is the light of Christ. And I know that to be the case because I got the baby Jesus backing me up right here, which I don't always, I do always have, but not a visual representation. <laughs> the darkness cannot overcome the light. You know, there, there are so many negative things going on in our world that it's real easy for us to go, oh, it's easy to find the negative. What's, what's hard to do sometimes is accentuate the positive. And there is so much positive. But, but in our minds, and I do this too, we, we, we're seeing the negative, and it's like, oh, oh my God. And literally, oh my God. But we have to look for the positive. We have to, we, we have to be the light. And she mentioned in her sermon that there's a, a New York Times column that she likes because this guy points out the goodness that is going on in our world. And there's always goodness. There's always goodness. Good things are always happening. And if you can't see a good thing happening, you call me. And I will point out something in your life that is goodness. Or call a friend. And say, hey, help me. I'm the darkness is starting to overcome. I need a little bit of your light. Can you help me out here a minute? Kim and I had forgotten about SAD, seasonal affective disorder. We, the last 12 years, it was like we get up in the morning, oh, the sun's out again. <laughs> oh, good. More sunscreen today. But back here over the last 12 months, <laughs> we're like, you know, we see a little glimmer of sunlight coming out, and we're like, Oh, look, the sun's out, and then boom, it's gone. So welcome back home again to Indiana. But there is always goodness, and, and we need to be the beacons of that goodness, of that light to other people that may not see it as clearly as we do. We have to look for the positive. You know, it was interesting because with all the terrible things that were going on in our world, you know, our grandkids were very excited about not only Christmas, but us being here for Christmas. We're normally not. And so it was, it was lovely to, to see their excitement, to feel their excitement, to be here with them. You know, you almost forget, if you're not careful, you almost forget, you know, this, a childlike excitingness on Christmas morning. And that's what we have to capture, a childlike excitedness of where we are and who we are and whose we are. You know, it's, when we become adults, we, we lose that childlike ability to grasp the next day, to put yesterday behind us, and to know that tomorrow's got to be better, and to make it better. And we can make it better. And we have to remember that we are the ones that are to shine our light. And, you know, it could be one way of doing this is for us to focus more on our role as being more Christ-like, as followers of Jesus. That's, that's what our baptismal vows are all about. And, 
yet I'm getting ahead of myself. So today is a feast day of the baptism of our Lord. We're celebrating the day that, that Jesus was baptized, and, and the Feast of the Epiphany was yesterday, the 12th day, 12th day of Christmas. You know, this word epiphany comes from a Greek word meaning to reveal. So if, if someone has a, an epiphany, they have a, a revelation, if you will. Um, and epiphany is the revelation, revelation of God in Christ to us. To us, each and every one of us. Originally, a long time ago, not when I was alive, <laughs> longer than that, okay, um, the original Epiphany, they celebrated four different events. They celebrated the baptism, baptism of our Lord. They celebrated his first miracle at Cana, which was the wedding, water to wine. Good job, good job, Dan. I heard you all the way up here. Well done, well done. And then his nativity, God becoming human, and the visitation of the wise people that came. And I say wise people because men never traveled alone. They always had an entourage of folks helping them. So there were probably children and women with them. But it was this magi that came acknowledging Christ, imagining the revelation of God in the world through the baby Jesus. Ep Epiphany represents for us our understanding that God revealed himself in Jesus to us. And this identity of Jesus then is becoming established. Unlike Matthew and Luke, the Gospels of Matthew and Luke, which begin, they all begin with the birth of Jesus. We jump right in to the Gospel you just heard today, which starts right at his ministry. It starts out the good news of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, begins with, with the ministry of John the baptizer, followed by the baptism and temptation of Jesus. So we start out in this gospel today right as Jesus is starting his ministry. There's a story about a teenager who had uh, gotten his driver's license and he was asking his dad to borrow the family car. And his dad said, okay, son, I'm going to make you a deal. I mean, how many of us have done that, right? <laughs> I'm going to make you a deal. If you bring your grades up, if you read the Bible every day, and if you cut your hair, I will let you borrow the car. And a month later, the son came back, and he was talking to his dad about this, and, and, and um, he said, uh, his dad says to him, you know, you brought up your grades, and you've been reading your Bible. The dad goes, but you haven't cut your hair. And the son said, well, dad, I've been thinking a lot about that. You know, Moses had long hair. Samson had long hair. Jesus had long hair. And that dad goes, you're absolutely right, they all did, and they walked everywhere they went. <laughs> For Jesus to be baptized by John in the Jordan, he would have had to walk a very long way to get there, quite a distance from Nazareth to the Jordan River to be baptized. And it wasn't just like, oh, I think I'll get baptized today, and boom. This was something that had to be planned. It was, also, it was basically almost a mini pilgrimage that had to take place. Um, it had to be done with intention and some kind of forethought. So the reports of John baptizing had made it to Jesus, and it must have been kindled, it must have kindled something in his spirit to say, I, I think I'm going to do this pilgrimage and be baptized by John in the Jordan. Now I want you to visualize and put yourself in the place of John the Baptist for a moment. He's out there baptizing people repentance for repentance of sins, baptizing lots of people. He's got tons of followers. And then all of a sudden, he spots Jesus coming to be baptized. Boom. There he walks, the Savior, the sinless one. He's coming up to be baptized. His heart probably skipped a beat, don't you think? And there are, you know, four... It would, the conversation would have been kind of funny, you know, it's like, well, John goes, well, you should be baptizing me. And Jesus goes, no, I want you to baptize me. No, you, know, you should baptize me. No, I want you to baptize me. If you could just imagine John the Baptist, he has said, you know, I'm not worthy to uh, untie the, the thong of his sandal. And here, Jesus wants him to baptize him. 
So for Jesus, as at the end, so too at the very beginning of his ministry, a deep and profound alignment to the will of God takes place. Jesus is aligning himself with the, the will and the spirit of God. It's more, our, it's more of a functional baptism, if you will, an outward rep- representation, um, something that, that uh, being baptized so that some function could happen, i.e. the forgiveness of sins. This is a revelatory baptism that takes place, that is enacting and confirming and making visible real what is already the case. And we hear, you are my son whom I love, with you I am well pleased. So if you think that this is going to be a cakewalk for Jesus, you know, a, a beautiful dove comes by, he's being baptized. i got to believe the Jordan River was a lot cleaner than it is today. He's being baptized, there's a bunch of people out there, the water's lovely, the voices from heaven are lovely. But what happens next to Jesus? Forty days of hardship and testing take place. He's being tested in the... And this is just the beginning of the good news that takes place, just the very beginning. But I will point out this. This is the only place, I believe, in the Bible where the entire Trinity appear together. I was thinking about that last night. Now, we had the grandkids last night, so I'm going to get a little leeway here, but I'm trying to think. I don't think there's any other place in the Bible where all three of them are present at the same time. The Holy Spirit descends like a dove. Jesus stands in the river and God speaks from heaven. This epiphany moment reveals yet another aspect of the identity of Jesus, his place as the second person in the Trinity. So his baptism represented his beginning of his ministry. Our baptism represents the beginning of our And it's a lifelong process. It's a transformation process that happens over and over and over, and it's not just, boom, you're done. No, this takes place. It's an ongoing, never-ending process. And, and if, you, if you remember, you know, I, we got this baptismal font. We painted it. We had our kids decorate it, and I stuck it at the entrance to the gym. And the sign was, this is your walk not only in life but in your spiritual life as well we walk from baptism all the way to the altar all the way to the cross so it's representative it's representative of our life and you can holy water is bapt is blessed every single sunday by a priest or a minister i know because i did it today and reverend amy did it last week and you're you're it's a reminder This water is an outward and visible sign of our baptismal vows, which you're going to have an opportunity to take today if you want. But we dip our hands in the water, and we make the sign of the cross as a reminder, not only of our baptismal vows, but also that we are saved by the cross. So it's an outward and visible sign of what they call an inward and spiritual grace. Our role here is to become more Christ-like. So Jesus starts his ministry with being baptized by John the baptizer. He also uh, becomes like us. Jesus becomes, God becomes human. And perhaps that's so that we can become more like him. He becomes human so that we become, we can become more divine. We identify with Jesus. So how do we become more like Jesus? A lot of times we really can't become like someone we don't know. So one of the ways that we can do that is getting a deeper knowledge of him through the reading of scripture, through participation in the life of the church. The deeper the, deeper the knowledge we have of Christ, the deeper our understanding of him and the more like him we can become. But this knowledge alone doesn't produce Christ-like identity. 
the knowledge we receive from the word that we hear, the word of God that we hear, it, it has to impact our hearts and it has to convict us of the need to obey what we have learned. And the really neat thing here is we have the free will to choose our behaviors, to choose our actions, and to choose who we follow. There was a theologian, a famous theologian, Stanley Arhas. He writes that Christians are called to be in community capable of forming people with virtues sufficient to witness to God's truth in the world. Capable of forming people with virtues sufficient to witness to God's truth in the world. That's what we are to do, just like Jesus did. We are called for the formation, and we're called to be witnesses. We're called to be Christ-like. This is what we're called to do, and it may take us all of our life to do. We're called to be witnesses to others who perhaps don't have the love of a community, the love of Jesus in their lives. What if you were the only little bit of Jesus that another person out there ever got to see? What if an action you took? When I was in the Diocese of Georgia, they, I went through this process, this course that they called uh, emotional intelligence. How many have heard what that is? What it allows you to do is, you know, when that, when that hair sticks up on the back of your neck all of a sudden and you're, you are ready for fight or flight, it gives you an opportunity, and I'm not good at this, not to say what's on your mind. <laughs> not to say what's on your mind, but to pause in that moment where someone has done something or said something and all of a sudden the hair's up like this and you're trying to decide what you're going to do. And with emotional intelligence training, they invite you to take a breath and to pause for a moment and really think about what you're, what you're, what you're going to say, how you're going to respond to this. So it's our response that I'm getting at here. How do we respond as followers of Christ? And if we, we think about that. You know, the disciples were very unhappy with the way Jesus responded to some things. They were looking for a warrior king. That's not what we got. So maybe sometimes our best response is not to respond. And that's, that's hard for us. It's hard for me. I, be, I immediately, seems like I be, get up on the defensive. <laughs> and I'm, I'm supposed to listen more. <laughs> I just got the nonverbal cue. <laughs> and to listen more would be good. And to listen perhaps really listen to what the other person is saying. You know, we've lost sometimes our ability to communicate in that way where I am not listening to respond, I'm listening to understand, right? Many times we listen and we're already thinking of what our response is going to be and we really don't hear. The words go in, but we really don't hear what that person is saying. So this gives us an opportunity um, to either offer feedback to the person. Let me tell you what... I, I think I heard you say, or you, get, you just take a moment. Because what happens is, you know, we hurt each other sometimes and we don't mean to. Because either what you thought you heard me say is not what I meant, or what I said was not what I wanted to say, and in either case, somebody gets hurt. So it's always good to, to go, help me understand where you are. So one of the ways we can do that is fulfilling God's will and leaving our own will behind, just like Jesus did at his baptism and just like he, he did on his movement and dying to the cross. I invite you to listen closely to the words of the baptismal covenant. They're very difficult words. They're hard for us. They're hard for me. Even in the ancient or the current vernacular, these are hard things for us to do. But with God's help, we can do those. But this is what we're called to do, all of us collectively as the body of Christ. We are called to live into our baptismal covenant. And that's where we need to live and be in the world. So I'm going to invite everyone to, to stand as you are able, or if you need to remain seated, you, you can remain seated, and to turn to the renewal of the baptismal vows.
I want to make sure that uh, the responses are heard by the people that are out online, so I'm going to ask you to be sure uh, that Kendall's microphone is on, and I'm going to invite the people watching also to renew their baptismal vows. So let's just take a breath, a breath in, just take a breath in and let it out slowly. Do you reaffirm your renunciation of evil and renew your commitment to Jesus Christ? I do. Do you believe in God the Father? I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. Do you believe in Jesus Christ, the Son of God? I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He, he suffered, suffered under Pontius Pilate. Pilate was crucified, crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. Do you believe in God, the Holy Spirit? I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Will you continue the apostles' teaching and fellowship in the breaking of bread and in the prayers? I will with God's help. Will you persevere in resisting evil and whenever you fall into sin, repent and return to the Lord? I will with God's help. Will you proclaim by word and example the good news of God in Christ? I will with God's help. Will you seek and serve Christ in all persons? loving your neighbor as yourself. I will with God's help. Will you strive for justice and peace among all people and respect the dignity of every human being? I will with God's help. May Almighty God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has given us a new birth by water and the Holy Spirit and bestowed upon us the forgiveness of sins, keep us in eternal life by his grace in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen.